you might have never seen this plane before. It was a unique supersonic nuclear bomber, powered by six monstrous jet engines and so fast that its paint peeled off the fuselage. It could reach over three times the speed of sound. But something went horribly wrong in its testing phase, and the entire project was abruptly scrapped. This is the untold story of the XB-70 Valkyrie, the doomed supersonic bomber. The XB-70 Valkyrie was an aircraft like no other, and far ahead of its time. It was capable of intercontinental flights and was practically unreachable by any fighter jet. Its wings folded down during supersonic flight, taking advantage of a phenomenon that had been recently discovered at the time. It was developed for one purpose, to fly from the United States at three times the speed of sound, reach the Soviet Union, drop a thermonuclear atomic bomb, then return to the United States and land safely. But even before the Americans could carry out this ambitious plan, the Valkyrie was involved in a series of catastrophic episodes. In the 1950s, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were escalating. Both countries possessed increasingly destructive nuclear weapons. However, the only thing they didn't have was a means of delivering these apocalyptic weapons to each other's doorstep. At that time, intercontinental ballistic missiles were still in the early stages of development and no fighter had enough range to travel long distances, and the existing bombers were too slow, making them easy targets for missiles. To address this difficulty, the concept of the XB-70 Valkyrie was introduced by North American Aviation. To make their project stand out from the competition, North American Aviation used a concept from a little-known report from 1956 proposed by two wind tunnel experts from NACA. This concept is known today as compression lift. When an aircraft exceeds the speed of sound, shock waves form from areas such as the nose of the aircraft the leading edge of the wings, the air intakes of the engines, and others. These waves tend to move away from the aircraft, but if they could be directed and trapped by a kind of tunnel under the wings, these shock waves would theoretically increase the lift of the aircraft. This was exactly the principle that the engineers at North American Aviation wanted to explore and introduce to the XB-70. That's why the wings of the XB-70 Valkyrie fold down creating a supersonic tunnel that traps the shock waves and increases the lift of the aircraft. Thus, during takeoffs and landings, the variable geometry wings are placed in the fully extended position. At about Mach 1, they are slightly folded down to 25 degrees. And at Mach 3, they are fully folded down to 65 degrees, taking advantage of the compression lift phenomenon. But much more than folding wings was needed to safely enter and exit Soviet airspace, since it had several missiles ready to attack. To avoid them, the Valkyrie was powered by six General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 turbojet engines, each with an 11-stage compressor, two turbine stages, and afterburners. They used a fuel called JP-6, specially developed for this aircraft, which had a high ignition point and a low freezing point. Each of these engines weighed about two tons and provided 30,000 pounds of thrust. These engines were housed in individual compartments, but since they were six engines capable of propelling the aircraft to supersonic speeds of just over three times the speed of sound, they needed a lot of air to function correctly. However, this air could not, under any circumstances, enter the engines at supersonic speeds because it would cause an immediate engine shutdown. Therefore, two variable geometry air intakes were designed, one on each side to prevent the supersonic shockwave from reaching the engines. These engines reached their maximum efficiency in supersonic flight and were designed to keep the afterburners turned on for most of the flight time. However, flying at three times the speed of sound would cause a huge friction with the air, which would cause the fuselage to heat so much that using the same aluminum that many aircraft are made of would not work the heat would soften and damage the fuselage. Fascinated by the Valkyrie? Check out our special collection of products at the Engineering Secret Store. We have books with various details about its history, t-shirts, hoodies, phone cases, and more. We offer fast free shipping within the US. Grab a 10% discount in the Valkyrie collection by clicking the link in the description.
Now back to the video. The XB70 was mostly made of stainless steel, a sandwich of composite materials known as honeycomb and titanium. These materials handled high temperatures during supersonic flight very well, which could reach 680 degrees Fahrenheit. And just like the Tu-144, the Concorde's competitor made by the Soviets, the XB-70 had canards, which are those smaller wings at the front of the aircraft. When an aircraft exceeds the speed of sound, the center of lift of the aircraft, which can be conceived as an imaginary point in the center and on top of the wing, where most of the lift is concentrated, begins to move backward. This creates a nose-heavy condition, where the aircraft has a tendency to lower its nose due to this displacement. To counteract this, some designs employ canards, which are wings that generate lift at the front, and also a way to avoid putting flaps on delta-winged aircraft. In some fighter jets, this tendency is counteracted by the use of thrust vectoring, or, as in the case of the Concorde, by moving its fuel through various fuel tanks scattered throughout the aircraft as it accelerates and flies supersonically. Special Delta Wings were used in the XB-70 designed for supersonic flight above Mach 3. At the rear of the Delta Wings, there is a series of elevons, a mix of elevators and ailerons responsible for roll and pitch movements. They were hydraulically controlled and could move individually or simultaneously depending on the adjustment. Along with them, it had two vertical stabilizers that moved as a whole. The cockpit was quite analog and had a crew of four people, a pilot, co-pilot, and two expansion officers with specific professions related to the mission. The seats of the entire crew became a kind of individual and personalized survival capsule that closed automatically in emergencies such as depressurization. They were specially designed for ejection during high altitude and high speed flight. But perhaps the most overly complex part of the XB-70 Valkyrie was the way the mechanism of its landing gear worked. The wheels were mechanically placed in a vertical position and were rotated 90 degrees to point towards the center of the aircraft, and only then they were stored in the landing gear compartment. This was one of the most complex landing gear retraction mechanisms ever developed. The tires were silver, not black, because Goodrich developed a special component that was resistant to high temperatures and embedded in the body and exterior of the tires to withstand temperatures of up to 359 degrees Fahrenheit. These tires were liquid-cooled from the inside through small tubes that circulated a chemical mixture. When the first prototype was ready in 1964, the testing phase began. But even in the early tests, several technical problems occurred, and even taxiing the aircraft on the runway was a difficult task simply because the cockpit was 65 feet ahead of the nose gear. It was only on September 21st that the first flight took place, to the delight of the huge team that designed it. However, the celebration was short-lived due to a hydraulic fluid leak that caused the landing gear to not retract. Soon after, an engine reached 108% of its power, forcing a shutdown. As the prototype was preparing to land, there was a problem with the brakes, which were permanently engaged, causing a fire as soon as the prototype touched the runway. The wheels were severely damaged, but the prototype survived all these problems, and a series of repairs were made. Two weeks later, on October 12th of that year, the prototype broke the speed of sound for the first time, staying just slightly above it. The prototype was decelerated and accelerated again to supersonic speed several times. Surprisingly, this caused paint to peel off the aircraft. Despite this, the aircraft was brought to a safe landing. It was found that the paint was too thick, which is why it was torn off in flight. On its 12th flight, while the aircraft reached more than Mach 2.6, the front section of the wing structure was sucked into the engine ducts, damaging engines 3, 4, 5, and 6. The pilots landed safely, but all the affected engines had to be entirely replaced. Finally, on October 14th, the aircraft was ready to reach Mach 3. 
but just two minutes after the aircraft was put in this condition, a large piece of the wingtip was torn off, forcing the pilots to make an emergency landing again. It seemed that as soon as some problems were solved, several others arose. Because of all these problems, the first prototype was limited to a maximum speed of Mach 2.5. Meanwhile, the lessons learned during the construction and testing of the first prototype were used to improve the second prototype, which was already being built. This included reducing the manufacturing time and adding five degrees of dihedral to the wings to increase the directional stability of the aircraft. But doubts began to arise as to whether the bomber would ever be able to reach and fulfill its objective. To make matters worse, the Soviet Union shot down a U-2 spy plane previously thought to be unreachable, at 79,000 feet of altitude. Soviet missiles had become more capable than previously thought. At the same time, American intercontinental ballistic missiles had become more capable and reliable, able to be launched from one country to another without risking anyone's life. With this, the future of the XB-70 became uncertain. There were proposals to turn it into an aircraft that would serve as a platform for testing other spacecraft, aircraft, or supersonic missiles. There were proposals to turn it into a supersonic aircraft for passenger transport, which was one of the most promising. But with cuts in project funding, it was reduced to just two aircraft. However, as many millions had been spent, the project continued. In 1966, NASA joined the Air Force in the testing phase with the only two prototypes, and valuable data about supersonic flight was obtained. The second prototype proved to be more capable than the first. On May 19th, the second prototype sustained speeds much higher than Mach 3 for more than 30 minutes, demonstrating its enormous potential. But then, disaster struck. On June 8, 1966, the second prototype, with its wings slightly raised, departed for another test flight and then joined other aircraft in formation for filming purposes. But a few minutes into the formation, one of the planes on the right, which was closest to the XB-70, got too close and ended up colliding. After the initial collision, the aircraft passed over the XB-70 and partially tore off the two vertical stabilizers. For 16 seconds, the Valkyrie continued to fly perfectly until it entered an uncontrollable spiral. In a matter of seconds, two pilots and a billion-dollar prototype were lost. It measured 185.7 feet long, had a wingspan of 105 feet, and just over 32 feet tall at the tail. It weighed 93 tons empty and 242.5 tons loaded. Its engines with afterburners propelled it to a maximum speed of 2,050 miles per hour. It had a maximum range of 4,908 miles and could reach an altitude of 74,400 feet, well above the reach of any interceptor or missile at the time. Its variable geometry wings folded down during flight, taking advantage of compression lift, and increased the lift of the aircraft by up to 30%. It had canards to solve the problem of lift displacement, and two vertical stabilizers, shorter than originally planned, due to the gain in stability provided by compression lift. The retractable nose improved the pilot's visibility during taxiing and landing. Special fuels, landing gear, technologies, techniques, and pioneering principles were developed specifically for this aircraft. The engineers had surpassed themselves and pushed all limits to create an aircraft far ahead of its time, which seemed to have come directly from the future. All of this was thought up, created, tested, and perfected in the 1950s when there weren't even computers to simulate fluid dynamics in minute detail or test rare aerodynamic phenomena that could occur at supersonic speeds close to Mach 3. But despite all this, they managed to create a truly revolutionary aircraft. In the end, the XB-70 never fulfilled its purpose. But not everything was a failure. Much was learned, and this learning was used in the development of the B-1B Lancer bomber,
and most importantly, in the development of the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest aircraft in the world today. If you enjoyed this episode of Engineering Secrets, consider subscribing and helping our channel through our Patreon or cryptocurrency donations. We try our best to bring high-quality videos for you. All the links are in the description. Thank you for watching.